Welcome to the Requilibrium Podcast. I'm Danielle Lacourte, and this is a conversation with Dr. Christine Seifert, who teaches rhetoric and strategic communication as professor of communication at Westminster College. She's written for a number of publications, including The Atavist, Harvard Business Review, Inside Higher Ed, Bitch Magazine, and she's also the author of four books now, I think. A dear friend and one of the most formative mentors of mine, this is Christy's second time on the podcast. She joined back in, I think, maybe 2015 for episode number three, which is where she and I first publicly talked about the implications and mechanics of rhetoric. And that's exactly what we do in this episode. We talk about how we talk about productivity and what implications that discourse has for our well-being and performance as individuals within systems. For more conversations like this, subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. All the show notes for each episode can be found on my website at daniellelacourt.com slash podcast. And you can also follow me on Medium, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Danielle Lacourt. That is L-E-C-O-U-R-T. So now let's get into my conversation with Christy Seifert. Dr. Christy Seifert, or as I know you, Christy. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, we've been talking for probably years about this topic, and I've been really excited about this conversation to delve into the rhetoric of productivity, because I think, you know, especially the time that we're living in now, um, the moment that we're living in now, I'll say, um, I think a lot of us are feeling tremendous pressure to be productive amidst insurmountable odds, right? And so I, I I like the idea of speaking with a rhetorician like yourself about, you know, starting to unpack these concepts around what do we mean when we talk about productivity. And um, I have to also say that you're about the most productive person I know. So I, I consider you an authority on, on the topic, um, not only as a rhetorician, but as a human being. Um, but I guess I'll just start with a really broad question that may be unanswerable, but what is work? I mean, if we think about productivity, we're often talking in terms of work and in terms of output, right? So how would you, as you know, coming from the field of rhetoric, how would you start to unpack that concept of work? Oh, wow, that is, that's a question. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's a big question. Yeah. Um, and it is, it is one that I think about a lot. Um, and I know you and I have had many conversations in the past where we have tried to think about that term in various ways. Um, I mean, in the, in the research that I've done and in the writing that I've done, I, I've sort of come to see the accepted definition of work as something that produces um something that produces some sort of product or output, preferably that can be traded for money. And I'm not mm. saying it's necessarily the definition of work that, that I want to embrace or that everyone embraces. But I think that when we talk about work in um, productivity manuals or, you know, all the time management guides that we're all reading um, the kind of pop culture of work-life balance work seems to be something that is cast in the role of something that produces a product and which brings money to you. I think Mm -hmm. there's a problem with that concept of work because it necessarily suggests, I think, that the individual becomes um, interchangeable or um, sort of threaded in with that concept of work in which we become the product, like our labor is becoming the product that is then in fact turned into money. And if we can't think about work, if we can't step back and think of work in terms of, in in some sort of other realm of definition, I think it becomes really difficult to have a real conversation about work. So just like as an example, I oftentimes hear people talking about doing the work of you know, thinking through um, racism or 
structural inequities, right? Like I think especially this summer, we heard people saying, we've got to do the work, we've got to do the work. And it's largely white people who are saying this, that this is work that has to be done. But Mm -hmm. because that is work that doesn't necessarily result in a dollar amount, it becomes work that is, um, can be seen as less important than the work that produces something that can be bought and sold. So even though doing that kind of work can be extremely beneficial, and I mean, I would argue is necessary for us to do, it's going to be considered lesser work because we all sort of operate under this idea that work means money. It's production. It's it's something that can be produced mm-hmm. and then turned around and put into the marketplace. And I think that's where we have a disconnect when we talk about what is work, because this broader definition is just not something that we are either willing or able to accept as a culture as a whole. And I'm glad that you are starting to go there because my whole goal for this conversation, I guess, is to get at those underlying metaphors that that drive how we see work and how we see a productive human life. And I speak about this a lot as a mother um, and as a mother who was actually, you know, intellectually and as a person, I came of age and was raised in the discipline of sports, which has a very different idea of what work is and has a very different idea of productivity. However, it still is tied to some kind of output. But then, you know, following a lot of these threads that speak about high performance and all of these thought leaders in the realm of high performance in particular, um, I'm frankly tired of being told that the biggest way to maintain productivity in adulthood is to never have children. Because to me, it places it places family and it places these other aspects of a full human life at odds with our purpose and our purpose being mainly to produce. I don't know if you can speak to speak to that metaphor a little bit. Full disclosure, and I think this is important, I don't have kids. And mm-hmm. one of the reasons I don't have kids, is, and there's many reasons, but one of the reasons I don't have kids is precisely because what you said. I mean, I, I learned early on that women especially have to make a choice. It is either have kids or be able to make um, decisions that open up more doors for you or do both and be in a double bind all the time of trying to do both. And I know that it is, it's, it's hard to talk about that reality because as a culture, I think we want to believe that we've made it and that, you know, women can now have it all, but you... I think are like a lot of working moms who recognize that no, actually this is unsustainable. It is unsustainable for um, um, our concept and our way of thinking about work to coexist with these other aspects of lives, including parenthood. Um, But I always kind of go back historically to think about like, how did we get here? And this might seem Mm -hmm. You know, blindingly obvious, but I think of you know, my own job in higher ed. The the job I had was designed for a man who had a wife at home doing the kind of work that I do in addition to my job. I mean, even my job in the institution now is one that functions with far less support than someone who did my same job, let's say 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 100 years ago. I mean, I, I don't, I don't have a secretary who manages my life. I don't have somebody, I don't have a wife at home who's making my dinner and doing my laundry. Um, and if I had kids taking care of my kids, I mean, the workplace still exists for a time that no longer exists. And while women have access mm-hmm. to doing any job we want, it, it's a bit of gaslighting that's happened for women because we're told go out and and do whatever it is you want. But the structure of the workplace has not changed at all. It still exists as if there's somebody at home doing all of that shadow work. And the fact that we can't talk about it um, or that we don't talk about it is 
part of that kind of gaslighting of, hey, what's wrong with you as an individual? You, Danielle, or you, whoever, like, why can't you do this? Rather than talking about this is a structural issue that comes from a workplace and a concept of work that was never built for you and for your Mm -hmm. work as a mother and as a human being, which isn't to say, by the way, I want to be clear. I think men can face a lot of these problems too. Um, I think it's, it's true for, Mm -hmm. for anyone who is trying to work and have a meaningful life outside of work that we, we have to remember that the workplace was not designed for that because the assumption was that there would be shadow labor, um, at all times. And by shadow labor, just to clarify, do you mean unpaid labor? Yes. Unpaid labor or, or or extremely low paid labor. Um, and it, I mean, I think also I speak, I'm speaking here largely about white collar work. Um, but, but we know that historically, you know, it, it isn't anything new that, that women are working. It's just that it's white women who are working more in white collar spaces, but women of color have always worked, have always had to manage that burden. Um, and I, and I don't want to dismiss that reality and what that, that looks like, but as more women mm-hmm. have entered into white collar working spaces, there is no more, there isn't that sort of unpaid labor or low paid labor that is happening behind the scenes that historically would be true of anybody in like an extremely middle-class job, like being a college professor. I mean, now you have to be a multimillionaire to have that sort of support in your, in your home. And you don't, and you don't have the luxury of having a spouse who, I mean, even if you do have a spouse, you don't necessarily have the luxury of that spouse being at home to do all of the things that that need to be done on a day-to-day basis because we live in an economy in which you can't buy a house on two incomes, let alone one. I like that you kind of started to go there and I want to bring it back because I know you've written on this in the past, um, again, to that note of you being the most productive person I know, but um, one of your books, you know, you, you, you've looked at this idea of labor and kind of it, through a historical lens in the United States um, and, and, and what, what, how this idea of work gets coupled with this idea of labor gets coupled with this idea of production. Um, can you speak a little bit about, you know, some of these topics that you've written about when it comes to labor in the United States and, and the story that kind of got us here in that respect? I'll start with an anecdote and then um, maybe we can connect it back to that, that bigger question. When I was writing an article last year about productivity and what productivity means, I did a little unscientific experiment and I emailed several people and asked them to tell me what word is the opposite of productivity, because I wanted to get a sense of how people were defining productivity by looking at the antonym that people would most attach to that. And it probably won't surprise you that the most common word that people picked was laziness. And I thought that that was a really Mm -hmm. interesting term that people picked um, because productivity, um, with an opposite word of laziness suggests that productivity has this moral shading, right? Like to be productive is to be motivated. It is to be, um, it is to be not lazy. It's to be not slothful. It is to actually um, be not just engaging in work, but doing so because it is a, a moral and upstanding way to live versus if we look at productivity or anti-productivity as laziness, that is slothful and immoral and certainly not something that we aspire to be. So we, we carry into our ideas about work and production, these ideas about what, what makes us moral human beings. Um, and the reality is there is nothing inherently moral about mopping a floor at McDonald's versus not mopping a floor at McDonald's. <laughs> it's, a, it's a transactional relationship that shouldn't necessarily have these moral undertones associated with it. There is nothing sort of morally superior about me spending my afternoon um, sitting on my couch versus me um, scrubbing all the floors in my house, right? Like, but but we think there is. And and we um, enact um, Mm -hmm. 
our days and our ideas and our thinking around that kind of concept that there's something inherently moral about production. And I think that when I was doing the research for my book on the triangle shirtwaist um, factory fire, that that particular factory, but it wasn't just that particular factory, the kind of concepts of um, industry at the time, and I don't think they've changed, by the way, the idea was that you could get individuals to give as much as you could possibly, as much as they could possibly give. And companies would try to do that by paying the least amount of money. And they could do that because of the the number of people who wanted jobs relative to the number of jobs available, right? So there's like that sort of economic um, supply and demand. But there was also this sense baked into that whole story that I think is really important because people were convinced or asked to side with management, essentially, because they believed, and I think we still believe this, that working is what makes you a worthwhile person. And I'm not saying that people who worked in the Triangle Shirtwaist factory were doing so because it was, you know, because it was the right or the moral thing to do. I mean, they need money, right? Like they need to be able to eat. They need to be able to pay Mm -hmm. rent. They need to be able to support their families. But in addition to that, there is this pervasive ideology or narrative of the good, hardworking American immigrant who will come in and work as hard as necessary regardless of how much money you make or regardless of how you are treated by the organization itself. So it has become this extremely individual pursuit where if it isn't working for you, then it must be because there's something wrong with you rather than no, the system has essentially indoctrinated all of us to work toward um, as much production as possible for the benefit of somebody else. And that is really hard to think through and it's really hard to resist. Yeah. So working as hard as you possibly can for the benefit of someone else with incentives for you peppered in along the way, enough to keep you going. I I, I think that's a really great point. And I love that you're hitting on the morality of it. And I want to get back to that. But first, I'm wondering if you can just orient the listeners a little bit on the the Triangle Factory. What 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 time was it in? What happened there? So around, um, oh, around the, the turn of the century, um, the 20th century. So um, early, early to um, mid 1900s, I'm blanking on the exact day of the, the fire. Um, the garment industry in, especially in New York city, um, was, was huge. And as more and more immigrants came to America seeking, um, you know, what every, what every human being wants, right. Like to be able to raise your family and to have a place to live and to eat. Um, there was an influx Mm -hmm. of labor And as a result, um, these um, garment industries, and it wasn't just garment, but primarily garment industries, um, were able to hire pretty much anybody they wanted for the lowest amount of pay possible. And they did so with no oversight from, there's no federal regulation, right? You can hire children, you can make people work 14 hours a day, you can make them work seven hours or up. 14 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, You can Mm -hmm. um, fire people for the smallest infraction. Um, You can fire people for unionizing, which is what happened. As soon as people started to protest or to organize in any meaningful way, then you fire everybody and start over again. And it was an environment where it it was kind of the Wild West where you could do, where, where people who had ownership could do whatever they wanted. And they did so as a pursuit of maximizing their economic benefit because they argued that that's rational, right? Like if you own a corporation, your job is to, or a company or anything that's producing something, you want to maximize your output 
and minimize the, the costs that are going into it for you, including for labor. And so not thinking about employees as human beings or as individuals or as people who um, have a, a right to be treated not just well, but just even humanely doesn't enter the equation mm -hmm. because it costs more money to do that. I mean, I don't want to be clear. I'm not advocating for that at all, but this is the environment <laughs> in which right. the garment industry is thriving in um, all, all of America along the whole East coast, but particularly again in New York city. So in the triangle factory, um, the owners of the factory, like, like many other factories had figured out that if they don't have proper safety protocols in place, no big deal. Um, they had insurance on the company itself. So they had had fires before. Um, and frankly, the insurance payouts were bigger than the cost of the fire. So it's worth it for them to um, insure high and minimize costs in terms of like everyday operation. Um, and one of the things that they did was lock the factory doors um, so that nobody could leave early or, you know, during the day. They also searched everybody on the way out the door to make sure they weren't stealing any thread or a piece of material. And on a day when they had had a, a big pileup of excess fabric and paper patterns hanging up all along the factory floor, somebody, um, uh, did not properly extinguish a cigarette and a fire started and hundreds of people perished in the most horrific ways that you can imagine because the doors were locked mm -hmm. and there was no way out. And people were jumping out windows. People were jumping down the elevator shaft. Um, and this was mostly women, mostly very young women and mostly immigrant women from Eastern Europe. And the reality is that mm -hmm. that could have been prevented by some simple safety precautions, some more concern on the part of the company itself to protect its workers, but they had no financial incentive to do so. And that's where I think like this idea of pure capitalism starts to break down. If everybody maximizes their ability to make money, there's nothing saying that you have to protect individuals. And many of the... Um, the laws and regulations that you and I benefit from today actually come out of that time period and come out of the Triangle Factory. I mean, there's a reason why our employers have to pay our health insurance if we're full time. There's a reason that we have to be given breaks. There's a reason that you can't hire a 12 year old. And all of those things happened as a result of complete lack of care for individuals. And that's good. And I applaud that kind of progress. But at the same time, we still fundamentally live in a culture that prizes maximizing the dollar amount, even if that means harming the individual. I love that you put this into historical perspective, and it's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on because about two episodes ago, I was speaking with Eileen McNeely from Harvard Shine, and there's these pockets of researchers that are taking this different lens and seeing and actually studying the benefit of what happens when companies care about their people and you know how does this fit into this idea of what if we're not here to just survive but thrive and flourish as as individuals and as a collective and it's it's so interesting to have these extremes in in mind when speaking about these things because you know, and I get to a point personally where, you know, we can talk about all these systemic things uh, all day and I still want to be productive. It doesn't change at all. It does not change my desire to want to do that. And I think that, you know, this interplay between the individual and systems has become a personal fascination of mine because, you know, especially when we're living in a turbulent time. We're living in a global pandemic. I think we're all trying to find some semblance of purchase in how we as individuals show up. And so there's this there's this one side that is trying to take agency and ownership over what I produce and what I put out into the world. And I do view 
you know, parenting is part of that as part of my productivity, even though you can't see it for probably 18, 20, 30 years. But it's one of those um, slow moving investments of time and energy that I think serves the collective and obviously me. Um, but I, I, I'm wondering how you reconcile those two things, because again, you're a highly productive person. You put a lot of things, you create many things and you're thinking deeply about really difficult topics. So how do you as a person holding all of that systemic stuff in mind, navigate this space of, and this concept of productivity? I'm curious to hear what you say. Well, I can't say that I have reached any place where I have become an expert and can guide you, but I will tell you. <laughs> tell me what to do, Christy. Yeah, yeah. I, I get that question a lot um, yeah. because I actually write a lot about what, what I call um, anti-productivity. And again, people will sometimes assume if I tell people, oh, I write about anti-productivity, people think that I am writing about laziness again, or mm -hmm. um, you know, sitting around and doing nothing like that I'm advocating for, like, let's all just like sit on the couch in our underwear and watch TV, which there's no issue with that, but I'm not suggesting that that, that that is necessarily where we all want to be 24 hours a day. When I think about right. anti-productivity, I think of it as being cognizant of where we are choosing to put our productive time and being thoughtful about choosing some things over other things. So it really just sort of being aware of how that system is working on you. So you mentioned, you know, seeing your work as a parent as part of your productive day, which, which it absolutely is. And so when you are doing something for your kids, whether it's, you know, making their dinner or giving them their baths or washing their clothes or, you know, all the million things that you do as a mom, recognizing that that is in fact production that that is in fact a form of productivity. And just thinking that is actually a form of resistance. It's a form of saying like, I am recognizing that this is work, that this is labor and it can be a labor of love. It can be a labor um, that you oftentimes maybe enjoy doing, but it can also be labor that you hate. I mean, nobody likes cleaning up a kid's vomit or you know any other gross things that you have to do when, when you're a parent. Right. But it is all labor and it is okay to think of it as such and to think about that in terms of all of the ways that you spend your time. And look, I'll, I'll use an example that's more personal to me. My emphasis on anti-productivity at work often asks me to think about which tasks I want to spend the most time on. Some of the tasks that I'm being asked to do are tasks that are much more beneficial to the organization than they are to me personally. And some of those tasks are things that behoove me to do, to do because when the organization does well, like I am part of that, but other times I have to weigh the tasks that will benefit me more than the tasks that will benefit my employer. And I can make those decisions. And I just want to put an asterisk on this, by the way, because I recognize that I am in the type of job where I have the power to be able to make those decisions. I think it's much harder when you work at Starbucks, for example, you don't have the time or the luxury to sit around and be like, do I really want to do this task for the organization? And that's, I think that's where the right, right to get bigger. Right now, the, the people who can engage in anti-productivity and the sort of resistance to this culture of time and this culture of output are largely people who have power. And that in itself is important to recognize. Well, and I want to get back to your point that you kind of touched on a little bit earlier about this inherent moral quality of productivity. And I, I'm... I'm thinking of this in a, in a particular way because wanting to see the bright side of that, you know, and, and having a background in anthropology um, extends the timeline on this concept of, you know, contributing to a group, right? And so I, I think I can see a nugget of wisdom in that, in that underlying metaphor of wanting to again, serve your group and wanting to be uh, connected to a larger whole, whether that's an organization or a community or a family, but some kind of unit and being able to bring 
something forth that benefits everybody. Um, I do think that it's interesting to see that underlying metaphor play out within a hyper capitalist framework because it kind of plays on this thing that I think is wildly human and plays it into a, this new this new form that ultimately, especially in a very individualistic society, um, leaves a lot of people without the supports and benefits of the groups that we used to serve as as a collective species. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I I. I think that's really interesting that you're bringing you're bringing this back around to thinking in terms of anthropology. Um, I think that it's important to remember that we haven't really, we as a culture, don't really spend much time talking about productivity as something that can have long term benefits. I mean, we tend it, it goes back mm. to you, know, you use the term a hyper capitalistic. Um, structure or framework. And so it, we make a lot of decisions in the short term, right? So we're, we're mm-hmm. constantly maximizing our benefits within a very short period of time and ignoring what happens in the long term. I mean, the pandemic is a perfect example. I mean, we lived in a particular way for a really long time without thinking at all about what the, the actual repercussions of that might be. And we're seeing the repercussions in terms of the environment. We're seeing it in terms of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. I mean, we haven't really reckoned with the way that our decisions affect other people. And at least in the United States, I think we've got a whole group of people that are actively resisting the idea that we should ever do anything for the good of the group. I mean, people who don't want to wear a mask right. are essentially arguing, I shouldn't have to wear a mask because it doesn't directly benefit me right here, right now, today. And it's not surprising that mm-hmm. that's how people are responding to it, given the way that we have created a culture that is very short-term, very immediate, very individualized, and very focused on um, mm-hmm. financial benefits. As far as how do we get out of that, I think, and then this is going to sound a little um, high in the sky probably, but I think even starting to change the metaphors or the language that we're using to talk about production, to actively talk about the things that we do that benefit the group in the long term as being valuable, productive work. So I just read a, a study today about the amount of labor that female faculty in higher ed take on in terms of advising and um, relationship maintenance, essentially. Um, Women do a disproportionate amount of work. They're asked more often and they're punished more for saying no, but it's work that is largely unrecognized. So when you go up for tenure, it really doesn't matter how many students you sat with in advising, you know, in your office hours and help those students sort of figure out their problems or their life or their goal, like that kind of work is oftentimes um, undermined in in really big ways. And Mm -hmm. one way we can address that is to just start naming that work. We can just start naming that that Mm -hmm. is work, that it is work that benefits the entire group and that it is work that ought to be recognized. And that includes everything from that kind of emotional labor at work that I'm talking about to the kind of parenting work that happens at home we need to get into the habit of talking about that as labor, not to undermine it or not to suggest like labor in the, with a negative connotation, but that those are in fact contributions. But to do that, we have to seriously challenge this idea that work or production is only relevant to that, which makes money directly. And I'm glad that you brought up the metaphor thing. And I, I wanted to come back to that too, because And I think I told you offline that, uh, so I'm a writer by trade and I have also studied rhetoric and it's, you know, it's, it's part of my orientation as a person. It's part of how I think about the world. Um, And at the same time, you know, words are both really powerful and sometimes meaningless, right? Um, But I think there is merit to talking about why it's, why framing is important and why the way we speak about things are important because I know that there's been pushback in the culture at large about that, about why does it matter the words we use? Um, there's a, there's a, 
neuroscientist, I believe she's a neuroscientist or psychologist, uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett, but she's done a lot of work about the neuroscience or neurobiology of emotion. And she talks about this very concept that in her studies, it plays out that even having a wider vocabulary for emotions changes the actual experience of an emotion. It changes the way you experience that thing. And there's study after study amongst many different cultures throughout the world that substantiate that. And I think it's a nice um, kind of, it's a nice example of how the way we think about things shapes our lived experience and shapes our reality. And I, I know you have more to say about why framing matters because it's it's formed the basis of many conversations uh, between us throughout the years. But can you speak on that a little bit more? Yeah, I, I mean, as going back to what we chatted about earlier in this conversation, the, the the framing of work is is very much a moral frame, and I think that is something that we have to address head on. That there is nothing inherently moral about work. You can have, you can do work that can have moral, you know, sort of a moral outcome or that can contribute to good. Um, but the, the idea of sort of motion or production as simply being good by nature, just by definition, is deeply problematic. I know an example that I shared with you um, in one of our previous conversations is when I was in high school, I worked at Kmart. And one of the things that we were I was cashier, you know, so a checker. And when we didn't have customers, we were supposed to be straightening the, um, like the gum and the mints and everything in the magazine racks that are on the aisles of the checkouts. So if it was a day where we had a lot of slow time, um, you don't need to, I mean, it's been straightened. Like once the gum is in the box and the magazines are organized, there's, there's nothing to do. And yet we were told just keep re-straightening it. So it was the matter of like, you know, pushing the gum to the back and then pushing it to the front. It was finding motion because then um, the argument of the manager was that it looked bad to have workers just standing there. So if we were busily, you know, doing this straightening, it appeared that we were in motion and we were producing something. And therefore it appeared that the store was somehow, you know, sort of morally acceptable. And I think about that story a lot because I see it a lot in all kinds of um, work contexts where the actual like outcome of something is less important than the visibility of moving around and showing that something is happening, even if it's all a sham, even if it's there, there isn't actually anything happening as a result of it. And I, you know, what you said about, you know, being able to talk about an emotion with a bigger vocabulary, I think that's a great parallel here because when we can talk about work mm -hmm. and productivity in more nuanced ways, it allows us to actually get at what do we really mean when we say that we have to be mm -hmm. productive? What counts as productive? What doesn't count as productive? There's a, there's a book that, that has been really useful for me called um, Counterproductive, and it's by Melissa Gregg. This is a book that um, is published by Duke University Press, and it has a fantastic historical overview of productivity and looks at where these concepts of productivity actually came from. Um, but one of the arguments that Gregg makes in this book is that productivity is an epistemology without an ontology. So it's a system of knowledge that doesn't actually have any substance. She actually says it's it's um, mm -hmm. a, 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 a total, please say that word for me. It's a circular, uh, circular logic, <laughs> tautology. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> the tautology. <laughs> I didn't even know that word existed, so. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. So it's like in terms of circular reasoning, Greg is arguing that we as, as workers are taught that we should do more so that we can produce more, so that we can then work mm -hmm. more, so that we can do more, so that we can work more. So the, it's a it, it's it's this endless circle where production is meant to get more work done, so that you can get to more work. Like the reward itself is that you can then be more productive, rather than 
I mean, yes, there is, there is something to be said for, you know, in some cases you work harder, you make more money, but the reality is that for most jobs, that's simply not the case. The amount of work you do does yeah. not correlate with how much money you make. There are jobs that are far more yeah. difficult than others that require far more work and make and produce far less, uh, pay far less, um, in income. Greg is sort of making this argument that it's the great myth that we've been sold, that if you work more, then you will get some mythical prize. But the reality is you just then work more to work more, to work more, to work more in this endless circle. Mm -hmm. And when asked, why are we doing that? The answer is because work is good. Yeah. Work, work is the end instead of the means to an end. And I, I, I love that. And it's funny that you mentioned that too, because I remember, um, in thinking about this episode, I, I was Googling and trying to find any articles that talked about this. And I stumbled upon one accidentally that you wrote. Um, but, but it, it talked about, and this is something that I bring up to a lot of people and it's probably why I don't have a bigger platform and don't have a bigger social media presence because I always get stuck on this idea of, okay, well, you need to produce content and you need to be putting things out there and you need to be posting three times a day. And I always get stuck on the question of why <laughs> does this thing need to exist or am I, and I think it goes to, for me and you know, and um, I'll just disclose to the audience that I, I've, I come very rooted in a lot of Buddhist philosophy and that to me, and a lot of the rhetoric around productivity in our culture comes from this egoic place that it's, you know, only to amplify me so that you know who I am. And for me, that's not a good enough reason. And I think that there are some really great leaders and some really great, great leadership writers who talk about this and talk about this idea of service leadership being one of those of... Um, you know, what are you doing to serve your customers? What are you doing to serve your audience? But I think it goes beyond the business context of, you know, if I'm doing this, what am I doing to serve my family? What am I doing to serve the people that I meet at the grocery store? Just, you know, having that orientation, again, you know, that that nugget of morality to productivity that I like, this this idea of contributing to a group and contributing to group well-being. I think comes when you can step out of that egoic place and step out of doing it just to look like you're doing it or just to look good or just to amplify your platform. So more people will listen to you say things that they actually already know, you know? And so I, I don't know what, I don't know what the solution is to getting people to widely adopt this idea of like, have a good reason for doing that that's beyond yourself. But I, I, it, it seems entrenched in all industries that I've ever worked in and all circles that I've ever run in, um, with maybe the exception of sports. I think sports are one of the last remaining meritocracies, you know, to where you are showing up every day to contribute to a group, especially if you do team sports, right? Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. I, and you, you know me well enough to know that as soon as you mention sports, I'm like, I have nothing. <laughs> I, <laughs> So very little about sports, but that's such an interesting, that, that's such an interesting place to think about where resistance is happening. And, and I wonder if that's because the kinds of sports you're talking about, like team oriented sports, it has to be about the team. But I think if you start thinking mm -hmm. about professional sports, then I wonder how, where that breaks down, because it, you know, when you start thinking yeah. about like sponsorships and um, advertising dollars, then then I suppose we start getting back into the same issues of of production and which which um, teams are going to um, play well on TV versus you know teams that are not going to get as much play. Yeah, we we get nice and capitalist about it when it hits the professional level, and I think maybe I was blessed to <laughs> never have been in a big enough sport and never made it uh, to that level. I mean. Um, at least in the United States, there's there's not much of a professional volleyball circuit besides beach volleyball. But but it does – and I guess my point with all of that is, again, we can talk about all of the systemic stuff and all of the metaphoric stuff, and I still want to be productive. And I still want to – I have that drive to bring my best, and it's in spirit of serving a group in, in bringing my best in order to 
produce content that hopefully somebody will see and get benefit from and maybe be thinking about these concepts differently. And I don't know if you experienced that in, uh, in academia as well, that, you know, this, you have to really kind of stop yourself and why am I making this thing exist? Oh my gosh. I ask myself that pretty much every day. What, <laughs> why is this? Why am I, why, why am I doing these things? Right. Um, I, I hear what you're saying because I think about that too. You know, I write about productivity and anti-productivity and then, it, you know, I have a, I have a pretty big, um, set of articles and books and things that I've written, which seems to suggest that, that I do not take my own advice, which is somewhat true. <laughs> um, but again, I think I go back to this idea that resisting productivity does not have to mean not producing because I too want to be productive, but I want to change what it means to be productive. I want to make choices as the agent of my, of, of my own, um, professional and personal self and decide as much as possible what I am going to choose to put my energy toward and what, I mean, going back to what you said about deciding, you know, why am I putting this out there and what ways am I contributing? I think it's perfectly, I think that's a perfectly good start. I think that's exactly the kinds of thinking that needs to happen for us to, as a culture, to begin to resist this kind of idea of productivity. Resisting productivity doesn't have to mean not being productive. It Mm. simply means reshaping, reframing, rethinking and sometimes renaming what we call productive or production or productivity. And that means including in it the kind of work that we do that historically has been discounted as work. And that can be work that serves other people, that serves our colleagues, that serves our, um, you know, our, our, our culture, um, that serves our families, um, that those things should also be included when we talk about productivity. Um, I had mentioned to you earlier that I try to challenge myself not to use the word productive or productivity, which is funny because I probably said it 500 times today, but I try to think in terms of um, <laughs> contribution um, or um, mm-hmm. like sort of thinking about spending my time or devoting my time. Um, I'm trying to think of ways to reframe that concept so that I can actively remove myself from productivity culture, which sometimes my resistance is is very small. And it may just be asking myself, am I choosing to do this because I believe in what it is that I am doing and that it's its outcome? Or am I doing it because I'm steeped in productivity culture and I feel like I need to be doing something? I feel like I need to be straightening the shelves at Kmart. And it can be as small as, you know, trying to decide if I should spend an afternoon reading a book or cleaning my house. Am I cleaning my house because I will appreciate the results of it after and my house needs to be cleaned and I am actively choosing to do that work? Or am I cleaning my house because I have this guilt in me that says, if I'm not producing something, um, I am worthless or I am immoral. And I think even pausing to ask yourself those questions can be empowering. It's actually something that I encourage my students to think about, to take ownership of where they are choosing to put their time and their attention and to resist this idea that more is necessarily better. Well, Christy, you did exactly what I was hoping you would do in this conversation, which is you know, I really think it it's just expanding the concept to include more things and to include more people by including more things and really changing changing the orientation toward productivity to really get at all of this other stuff that still is getting done, that still is part of our lived experience, but isn't really being talked about in these spaces. So you did not disappoint. I am so glad to have you on again. Um, and you basically have a free open invitation to come talk about anything whenever you want. So I hope you'll come back again and talk about another, another fun concept that hopefully we can reframe for people. Thank you. I so appreciate you having me and chatting with me and I love what you're doing. Keep doing it. I'm a fan. Thanks.